Well, Victor, I, I think what really makes me optimistic is that no matter how many people I represent, and I've done a lot of criminal law over my life, I realise that there's good in everyone. In fact, there are very few bad people. There are people who do bad things. There are people who make bad decisions. But at the heart of almost everyone, almost without exception, there is a kindness and a goodness and a, a kind of honour there and and that keeps me hopeful throughout everything that I experience um, but I think it's um it is about celebrating that kernel of of goodness and that flows into the rest of your life too it's taking joy in the little things um, every morning when I go for a swim down at the beach where I live I am amazed and say I live here. <laughs> I am so lucky. So it's those sort of joyful moments that I, I think are really vital to maintain optimism is to remember the beautiful things that, that there are in nature, in human beings and, and in your relationships. I think that's and, and the, the reality of who you are, that sort of self-awareness and making sure that you respect that and honour that. That keeps me optimistic. What I wanted to share today is I think you make me optimistic, Vic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say that really genuinely because I see the way that you kind of keep going in the face of whatever, the 50 kilometer gale force winds you still go and get the roses you know but I, I do think that you can't depend on anyone outside of you for your own optimism I think having agency in your own life and that comes from when you start to listen to who you are and I want to say when we asked Holly oh you said oh you're the great artist are you she said I am and you go that's a good point to start you know and why Pauline's here today, because she's naming, this is who I am in all the kind of spectrum of my life. And I think agency and listening to your own inner voice and being guided from within can only make you optimistic because you see you move forward. So, but you do make me optimistic. I well, just... You are a great compliment in you to me. <laughs> now, Jane, what makes you optimistic? I would say in this moment that being part of this amazing, uplifting community, I know it's not by chance that I'm here. I'm very thankful to you, Victor, for finding me. <laughs> and um, also the realisation, especially of late, just uh, which has been inspired through this forum, um, the realisation that we are full of infinite possibilities. Holly, what makes you optimistic? Um, I guess what makes me optimistic is, you know, I've been through a few hardships in my life and at that time I kind of felt like maybe there's no way out of this, but there always is. Like I've gotten better from those things in the past and I feel like uh, what makes me optimistic is just the fact that I know that it, no matter in what any, like in any hard situation, I feel like I know there's always a way out of it. Good morning and good evening for those of you who are in the evening and in between zones. It's Victor Purton here at the Centre for Optimism. Look, a couple of things I just want to share with you. I, I went out, my garden is under a 50 kilometre an hour gale at the moment, but there are roses that have survived. And here's a beautiful orange one on my, my left and a beautiful yellow one on my right. And the fragrance is just mind-blowingly beautiful. So I've started the day with that. And then I'd just like to share a couple of other things with you today before we get started. Today, um, some scientists from the University of Essex published a study that said, one of the things that comes out of COVID is if you're watching something, it's better to be live than recorded, to be part of a webinar, to 
comment in the comment box, to send questions, to absorb the thoughts. And Caroline in the Optimist Heart has often said that, but it's the science from Essex University now verifies that. And then a second thing that happened to me this week was um, a neuroscientist from Sydney published a, an article in Psychology Today, which is the global psychology magazine, and reported on the Centre for Optimism's Better Normal project, and has joined uh, us as an advocate for this better normal that comes out of COVID. And so for me, this has been uh, an incredible week. And then Friday, we did a afternoon drinks, no agenda, for lots and lots of optimists. And I think that's going to be a, a permanent feature from now on, Caroline. But today we're here to celebrate the optimist heart. And this has been a fantastic series that has inspired so many people. And we've had so many fantastic guests. So good morning, Carolyn. Good morning, Victor. Lovely to see you again, as always on a Saturday morning. I mean, Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and Pauline, it, it's such a delight to welcome you. I am one of your members. I, I am a barrister and it's wonderful to welcome you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Victor. And Jane and Holly, um, you're going to share some art with us. Um, welcome to the first thing we always do at the Centre for Optimism, it's compulsory, is to ask what makes you optimistic. And I did a bit of a cheat because Caroline did a global broadcast last night on courage and optimism. And there was a question that was snuck into it that said, what makes you optimistic, Caroline? So she has practiced many times. So today may I ask you to share what you shared last night, Caroline, what makes you optimistic? Um, okay, Vic, you know, what I shared last night, I don't really remember so much, I never do. Um, however, what I wanted to share today is I think you make me optimistic, Vic. Um, and, and I say that really genuinely because I see the way that you kind of keep going in the face of whatever, the 50 kilometer gale force winds, you still go and get the roses, you know? But I, I do think that you can't depend on anyone outside of you for your own optimism. I think, having agency in your own life. And that comes from when you start to listen to who you are. And I want to say when we asked Holly, oh, you said, oh, you're the great artist, are you? She said, I am. And you go, that's a good point to start, you know? And why Pauline's here today, because she's naming, this is who I am in all the kind of spectrum of my life. And I think agency and listening to your own inner voice and being guided from within, can only make you optimistic because you see you move forward. So, but you do make me optimistic. I well, just... you are a great compliment and you to me. Now, Pauline, you know, all the work we do, Martin Seligman's research and everyone, and I've done a lot of work with some contracting organizations and the like. Many, many lawyers are pessimistic. Commercial lawyers write long contracts about what could go wrong you know, prosecution lawyers are often looking at the bleakest view of human behavior. And you are this ray of optimism at the head of the Australian Law Council. Pauline Wright, what makes you optimistic? Well, Victor, I, I think what really makes me optimistic is that no matter how many people I represent, and I've done a lot of criminal law over my life, I realize that there's good in everyone. In fact, there are very few bad people. There are people who do bad things. There are people who make bad decisions, but at the heart of almost everyone, almost without exception, there is a kindness and a goodness and a, a kind of honor there. And, and that keeps me hopeful throughout everything that I experience. Um, but I think it's, um, it is about celebrating that kernel of, of goodness. And that flows into the rest of your life too. It's taking joy in the little things. Um, every morning when I go for a swim down at the beach where I live, I am amazed and say, I live here. <laughs> 
I am so lucky. So it's those sort of joyful moments that I, I think are really vital to maintain optimism is to remember the beautiful things that, that there are in nature, in human beings and, and in your relationships. I think that's, and, and the, the reality of who you are, that sort of self-awareness and making sure that you respect that and honour that, that keeps me optimistic. Pauline, just such brilliance. Uh, honestly, that's, I will be sharing that quote around the world. That was just fantastic. Now, Jane, what makes you optimistic? I would say in this moment that being part of this amazing, uplifting community, I know it's not by chance that I'm here. I'm very thankful to you, Victor, for finding me. <laughs> and um, also the realisation, especially of late, just uh, which has been inspired through this forum, um, the realisation that we're full of infinite possibilities. Absolutely brilliant. Now, Caroline, do you, want to, do you want me to show Holly's beautiful drawing first? Uh, no. Why don't you ask Holly first? Or if you like. Well, firstly, we'll just do a very quick screen share, everyone. So have a look at this. This is Holly's work. Take 10 seconds, 15 seconds to have a look at it. Holly, what makes you optimistic? Um, I guess what makes me optimistic is, you know, I've been through a few hardships in my life and at that time I kind of felt like maybe there's no way out of this, but there always is. Like I've gotten better from those things in the past and I feel like uh, what makes me optimistic is just the fact that I know that it, no matter in what any, like in any hard situation, I feel like I know there's always a way out of it. Such incredible wisdom, Holly. There's a, a, the oldest book in English written by a woman is written by Mother Julian of Norwich. And in that she says, and she lived in the Black Plague. She lived through a period of persecution. She lived in a little cell. And she said, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. And I reckon that's lasted 700 years. But a man's got to know his limitations. The star of this show is my friend Caroline, and may I throw to you, Caroline. Thank you, Victor. Thanks so much. Um, can we put on screen uh, Holly's illustration? Because I'm going to ask her to speak to that. And I thought it was very, when Jane shared it with me during the week, I thought we have to have Holly speak to that. And it reminds me a lot of our guest today. So I could say there's uh, a whole bunch of lawyers and there's Pauline in the middle, maybe. But Holly, why don't you share with us what what did you, um, when you were painting or painting it, illustrating it, um, what motivated you and were you, were you always going for that or did it emerge? What does it mean for you? What are you saying in it? I'd love to hear that and I'm sure we all would. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess, so this uh, illustration is part of a 16 page comic that I actually wrote for my media class at school. So one of the reasons um, I had to come up with this storyline was um, I needed to come up with something for a project. Um, and I guess I really, um, so I guess, sorry. <laughs> um, what I wanted was, I kind of wanted to tell in the story that I had written and illustrated that um, in any bad situation, there's always like a light of hope. And this character in the middle named Nellie, she's kind of the light and hope in this situation. Um, so that's kind of what it represents, I would say. Which is very much what you were sharing earlier on, wasn't it? That in yeah. that situation. So do you think, I'd love to at some point see your whole, um, your work of the, the, the whole comic book, because I think that yep. would be really interesting too. Maybe we can have you back on with you and the comic book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah? absolutely. As a, as a whole show. So that would be great. Thank you, Holly, very much. Thanks, Jane, for sharing with us because, you know, a proud mum, for sure. Oh, yes. No, look, it's just great to see that um, the joy for me is her following her passion. And as I said to you, it just 
spoke to me, it just spoke of our current circumstances, all of us going through COVID and the challenges. And you think, you know what, despite your circumstances, um, you can choose your attitude. And I think Nellie, in that, that character highlights the power of optimism. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both so much. So we're oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, say thanks and bye bye and Victor is going to send you with all the rest of our participants and we're going to now hang out with Pauline. So I say a huge, huge, huge welcome to Pauline. And it's so great. We, we spoke on the phone, but I haven't seen you apart from my first saw you on Q&A and I went, I know that person. <laughs> you know, and I'd been away for a long time from Australia and, and I'm watching Q&A and I think it was about women in law and uh, there was something about harassment and it was pretty intense, the, the conversation. And I went, it's Pauline Wright. My God, it is Pauline Wright. And, and then I thought, I need to catch up with you because the last time I saw you, I think... I, I, I think the play was Alison Ashley. I'm not sure, but we <laughs> together. And I, you know, I was remembering um, when we did Agnes of God and you were still studying law, I think at the time. And, and I remember that I was the psychiatrist and you were the, you were Agnes, the young nun who oh, miraculously got pregnant, didn't know how. And uh, it was an intense play, that one quite intense so yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to have you so thank you so much for saying saying yes and it's terrific to to see you and I'm going to do something which I don't normally do I don't read bios because it's like we're not here as our careers but I'm I am going to do it because I think the purpose of having invited you is that um, you're saying no I am this whole human being. I'm not just a narrow um, person. So I'm going to read not all of it, but lots of it, because I think it's really interesting that you studied at uh, Macquarie and you did law and mass communication. So it's interesting that you're often a spokesperson yeah. for, for law. You've got um, uh, your graduate diploma also from the company as a company director. Um, now, this is old because it doesn't talk about you having just recently been appointed as president of the Law Council of Australia, which is significant. But you've been on the Council of the Law Society of New South Wales for 20 years or something like that. Okay. Um, it says here you're junior vice president. Perhaps that's, you know, not valid anymore. I don't know. But you're the chair of the audit committee, the environmental planning and development, criminal law committees. Um, a member of the Indigenous Legal Issues and Professional Standard Disclosure Committees, regular spokesperson for the Law Society. You're interested in probity and effectiveness of planning and you're president of the Urban Development Institute of Australia um, on the Central Coast, past vice president of the New South Wales Women Lawyers, member of the College of Law. Um, you've served as governor of the Law and Justice Foundation, Commissioner of Legal Aid, Commission of New South Wales. Um, you still sit as legal aid on the Legal Aid Review, Serious Criminal Law Selection Panel, Specialist Barrister Selection Panel Committees. You're also the past director of the Public Interest Advocacy Centre and the director of Public Interest Law Clearinghouse. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> and you're the Senior Vice President of New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties since 1998. Um, and you've been an active spokesperson lobbying for civil and human rights, particularly in the area of criminal justice, anti-terrorism and asylum seeker policy. Pauline's also a keen ocean swimmer, surf lifesaver, singer, actor, theatre producer, director and writer. And when I read that, I just thought, ah, oh, that's the Pauline I remember. You know, <laughs> passionate about life. So a huge and fabulous welcome to you. Um, and can you say um, how, when you listen to that, what's the fundamental 
truth that sits in all of those kind of titles, but how do you see yourself? I suppose when I listen to that, I think, oh, that's out of date. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think I've squeezed a lot into, into my life. And I've always done that. My mum used to talk about me burning the candle at both ends and in the middle, um, <laughs> which, which I think is about right. And, and my father on my wedding day said something very funny. He said, it's amazing that she's been able to put aside a whole day to get married. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, that's wonderful. That was his speech for me. Um, but I think, for, for me, it's, it's been about one side of my life is, has been driven by justice and the search for justice. Um, and and I, that really drives my professional self. I think that I experienced when I was a young lawyer um, unfairness and um, people being set up, the people telling lies in court. And I, I was kind of astonished by that you know, people who shouldn't be lying, you know, police officers, people like that. And this is back in the 1980s. I think things have changed a lot since then. But in those days, that was common. Um, and it was very confronting for a young lawyer to, to feel the unjustness of that. And that, that has driven me, for sure, um, in, my, in my professional career, my non-paid side of my professional career. That's all the, the Law Society and the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, of which I have been president. I think I was vice president according to that bio. But um, I, I, you know, all of those things have really driven me. And then in my, in my professional career as a lawyer, um, I've done criminal law all my life, though I've specialised in more recent times in environmental and planning law, which I also am passionate about because I think that we have to be really careful about the way that we treat our planet. Mm. And I think, you know, being a planning lawyer helps me to make sure that my clients who are proposing developments are sensitive to that and respect that. Um, and then if I'm on the other side and defending um, council's decisions to refuse a development or for a community action group, I feel, I feel I'm doing my little bit for the environment and I love that mm. but I've also made it my uh, I can't put aside who I am so I need to I suppose feed the news there's always got to be something creative going on in my life I so I've stuck with theatre my whole life when I knew you when we were very young mm. um doing those beautiful plays like Agnes of, Agnes of God is one of my favorite ever. I loved working with you on that. Yes. Um, I have since played the psychiatrist. Have you? Yeah. And it's my dream to one day play the, um, the right. old nun, the mother superior. So, so I will have played all three roles in that cool. one day. That's a dream. So I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. But, um, it's really important to me to fulfill everything and also um, to become, to be a whole person, that immersion in nature is something really important to me and swimming in the ocean, diving off the rocks into the deep, deep ocean and being immersed in nature is one of the most fulfilling extraordinary experiences you can have there's a bit of danger um but you're surrounded by that vast ocean and you're just a little droplet i think it's important to remember that we're all just little droplets you know i saw it last night someone posted on linkedin yeah. um kay clancy tagged me as a, a new short film called seabirds and it's uh, a group of 25 women. It started out three women. They're mostly, I would say, 60 to potentially 80. I'm not sure. And so it started out three women down at Mona Vale Beach every morning going swimming. And now it's 25 women. Yeah. And uh, they absolutely 
adore it. They wouldn't miss it. And the, the one who began it, the three who were at the beginning, um, they've been doing it for 13 years every single day. So, and they said very similar things. It's, it is an adventure and you're just this in the middle yeah. of the whole. And Pauline, do you think, do you think that this sort of balanced self, the creative self, the, the self that's part of a bigger story, as well as the intellectual justice seeking, hardworking kind of defensive um, planning self, do you think that enables you to be able to see the goodness in everyone, as you said? Or is it just part of your, your way of being, your nature? Look, I, that's very hard for me to answer, but I, I certainly think that my creative pursuits have made me a better lawyer. I think that I'm better at understanding people having been an actor because you, you do learn as an actor to stand, literally, to stand in someone else's shoes in this and inhabit another person's character. Yeah. So you've got to be someone else who's not like you. And I think that helps you to understand humanity. And for me as a, as a criminal lawyer in particular, I think it helps me to understand my clients and, and have that sense of <sighs> there, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, and I think that, I think that, that you develop a compassion, I think, when you are able to really stand in someone else's shoes and, and imagine what it's like to have come from the background that they've come from and to be who they are, why you might have made those choices, those sometimes appalling choices, but why you might have done that. And it makes it much easier to, I think, relate to people. So I do think that my creative pursuits have helped me in, in my career, for sure. Yeah. I, as you were talking, I was remembering I was in Brazil on a teaching tour once and, and they took me to a women's prison. Yeah. And in the, you know, it was all translated. So imagine, you know, I was being translated in this, in this dark room that had a tiny window that was all concrete everywhere. And there was a circle of chairs I was supposed to be doing. I can't remember what, but maybe it was, it was certainly to do with, um, you know, whether meditation or self-empowerment or this kind of thing. And I thought, what can you do in an hour and a half with people whose world, but, but I think exactly what you're saying, you know, to have compassion and, and I didn't really know what to do. And I could hear there were a lot of people out in the courtyard and we had about maybe six and about 20 chairs, but about six women. And I just sort of started to be with them rather than think I've got to teach them. I mean, you know, they could probably teach me a whole lot as well. And I thought, I don't know what to do here. And I just stayed really quiet and present and looked down wondering what can I do that will be useful. And I saw this pattern on the floor which was a diamond shape and what I started to do was to explore this idea that underneath the old the story and the conditions and who are you you're just this you know like this sparkling diamond and one by one just in this conversation that started to emerge and they responded and women started to come in from out of the noisy courtyard and we filled this entire room without calling anyone, just by starting to explore this idea that you're not your story, you're not the decisions you made. Who are you underneath all of that? So I think as you say that, it's, it's really, um, I, I feel deeply inspired that there are lawyers who think like this. I mean, I just think that's incredible. Maybe it's just one, but still one. No, no. I, I, I know that there are many, 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 many like me. I mean, we, when we imagine lawyers, we think about um, maybe American TV shows, but, but lawyers are not like that. The lawyers I 
have experience with on all the myriad of committees that I've sat on over the years, they all do this for nothing. They all give their time to, to considering laws and law reform and making the world better. And they do that outside their hours and sometimes inside their hours, losing, losing money that they could be earning. They're not money grabbing people. They, they sacrifice a lot to give back to the society that they feel privileged to be practicing law in. And I mean, there's, there's hundreds and thousands of them who do that all the time. So I, I feel very proud to be part of that profession that does that. So it's not just me, there's, there's thousands of us. That's tremendous. That, that is, that's enough to make everyone optimistic. Victor, I think very much so. So, so that's, that's really, that's really beautiful because I can imagine that, you know, the work that you do, that you all, you know, you come together, you use all your amazing wisdom, intellect, experience, foresight, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing to sculpt laws that are going to shape the future of society, not just, not just mitigate things that are, malfunctioning but mm -hmm. it's to think how would we want our society to be as well right so it's it's future planning future thinking from a goodness space to support the flourishing of a society so then you have to come up against government or work with government so what's that like when you put in all this effort and governments change and you have to lobby and or how do you do that and how do you stay optimistic and Look, advocacy um, for criminal justice and civil liberties is a tough gig because quite often um, the nature of power is to seek more power. Um, so governments who have power don't want to cede that power and they do want to ensure that they have enough power and that means more power. Um, to be given to its agencies. It's just the nature of power. So when you're trying to defend people's, the rights of the individual um, and advocate for that, it's, it's very difficult. So a lot of the time you feel like you're beating your head against a brick wall um, and you know you're not going to win every battle. But it's the times when you do influence um, the outcome that give you the hope to keep going. And if you don't do this work, you know that if you don't do this work, mm. um, that there is no watchdog. There's no one calling government to account other than um, probably journalists. Journalists and lawyers are the bane of politicians' lives because we do hold them to account. Um, and so I think it's, it's important that we keep going even though it's difficult and it doesn't always work but it does work sometimes and it certainly works to ensure that those in power are held accountable for the decisions that they make and for the laws that they pass. So we make sure that they know exactly what the ramifications of the new laws they want to pass are um, and we, we do written submissions to government. We give evidence at parliamentary inquiries, which can be quite gruelling. You have a whole panel of, you know, several politicians firing questions at you. It's not easy. Mm. Um, and you need to be absolutely on top of um, all the subject matter that you're talking about. As a leader of the profession, as the president of the Law Council of Australia, um, you know, some of, these, some of these inquiries and submissions are on subject areas in which I'm not an expert. Mm. But I become an expert because I make sure I read everything about it before I go into those inquiries. Wow. So I make sure that I know what I'm talking about so that I can argue coherently um, the principal position that, that we take. And so you would need to be doing that because the expediency, they're, they're trying to get around what you're proposing or what you're calling them out. So, so you need to know all of the permutations and 
nuances so that you can dance back right at them. Absolutely right. Because, you know, that they're there on that committee because that's something that they've got a particular interest in. So you need to be um, able and armed with every tool in your toolbox to respond um, in order to um, advocate for the position that you believe in as a, and, and my personal beliefs um, obviously have to be modified sometimes to what the law council's beliefs might be. Um, but happily, most of the time, they line up precisely. <laughs> Very nicely, doesn't it? But that must feel really also mm, satisfying. No, not satisfying is not the word I'm looking for. It's this sense of um, a community of, of individuals who are capable to care enough about things, who are capable and committed to care enough about humanity. And I mean, it must feel wonderful to be surrounded by or accompanied by or walking with these people and to celebrate and to commiserate at times too, I would think. Absolutely right. It's, it's, um, it can be devastating when something, um, when a law is passed that you've fought against because you can see it's going to have um, ramifications on particular sectors of society, for instance, Indigenous people. You know, you can see that a law that isn't intended to have that consequence will have that consequence. Mm. Um, and you, it, it, it's devastating. But it, it is that um, camaraderie with like-minded human beings who care that carries you through those times. And when you do have a win, you all celebrate together. It, it, it's this sense of achievement. Yeah. Even when you successfully argue your point um, to government, that's an achievement too, because you know that you've made them listen. Yeah. Even if they don't necessarily do what, what you're wanting them to do, you know they've listened, and that's as important as anything. That, that, that teaches me a lot as a lawyer too, how to, you know, how to communicate with people because where people feel like they've been listened to, uh, they, things are easier, easier for them, even if they don't go their way, if they really have been listened to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's fundamental, isn't it? In communication that, that we are able to not, not just speak a message, but, but to deeply listen. And then, then you find, and I'm sure you find this with your, well, in acting and, and singing, because you sing in your husband's jazz band, right? Yes, I do, yeah. Hey, so as a musician too, you know, you can't just sing. You, you have to be listening. And, and I remember when we were, you know, when you're acting too, you can't just ride through with your script. If someone's giving you another, another line that comes from a scene, you know, that they've, they've skipped a scene and they're, they're giving you something from, you know, two, two scenes ahead. You can't just drive through with your own thing. You've somehow got to listen and weave it back and get them back into the scene with you. And I'd say, too, your, your connection with nature is a way of listening beyond listening to just words, you know. So... Um, if we were all to listen more, what's your experience and how would you see a world where we were able to listen from deeply that space of curiosity, of wanting to understand, of, of putting yourself in the other person's shoes? How would you see the world shifting? Look, I really do think the world would change if we all really were conscious and mindful of listening the world would be a very different place because we would start to understand differences 
fear is such a driver in, in human society. When we don't understand something, a way of thinking or a, a way of being, we tend to be afraid of it. Um, but when we start to listen, we start to understand it and we stop being afraid of it. And then we become more accepting of it and um, we, can, we can welcome it to us instead of being afraid of it and shoving it away. And I think, I think that's, a, if I might say, a, that's at the heart of what the Uluru Statement from the Heart talks about, is that voice and being listened to. Um, and I think that if, if non-Aboriginal Australia were to give a proper voice and really listen to that voice, it would go a very long way to healing the rift that, um, that happened in Australia from the early days of European settlement. Well, I think we, we have a responsibility now to, to be looking at that. And I think that's, that's something that, that I'll continue to um, advocate for really strongly. So that's just one example of how I think listening can, um, can make a difference. And I think it could make a real difference to Aboriginal people if they had that deliberate voice to Parliament. It's a place to be listened to, to feel that they really are being heard for the first time. Yeah. I just want to leave a little space for that because what you just said requires listening with the heart, not just hearing with the words you said. Why don't you, do you want to take a moment to talk a little bit more about that statement from Uluru so that people who are, who are here this morning can hear, listen, feel a little more of what what you can bring us that, that is information from there, information in its, in its biggest sense. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the people who are, who are with us today probably know the Uluru Statement of the Heart um, came up in 2017. It was created in 2017. It was the largest ever gathering of Indigenous groups from across Australia who came together and came up with a statement and they, they gathered in Uluru in the, in the heart of Australia um, and came up with it it's actually quite poetic it's a poetic piece in a way um, but it, it's a fundamental and hopeful statement that really calls upon Australia as a nation to recognize the to recognize the greatness of the civilization of, of Aboriginal peoples from across the nation, the First Nations people, and to look to the future and see the hope for the future that the young people will bring if they're given the opportunity. And part of that opportunity is to make sure that they have a voice to Parliament. That is, that there is a a way of having an Indigenous voice um, listened to whenever decisions are being made that affect or pertain to um, First Nations people in Australia. So, and part of that is, is moving towards a treaty as well with, with the Aboriginal Australian people and the rest of the nation. So I think these things are, um, are vital if Australia is to heal. And I do think that there's a deep rift. When you look at the over-representation of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system, their over-representation in, um, in all sorts of uh, parts of the law. They, they have trouble with dealing with debts, with homelessness, with all sorts of things, um, as do lots of other groups in Australia who are disempowered. So they're not alone in that. Any dis disempowered community is going to suffer those same sorts of problems. Um, but if we want to change the record and close that justice gap, 
I think it's just, it is essential that we listen to the people that, whose lives we're actually talking about. They should be front and centre. It should be community-driven solutions to the problems because they know. We've seen in, in um, some communities in Australia, like um, out in Burke, the justice, justice reinvestment idea, which is spending the money that you would have spent on prisons locking people up and spending that on communities and building up and strengthening communities and making sure that people's needs are covered and met and that there are wraparound services available when somebody looks like they're falling through the net. Um, that has worked. The, the rates of um, behaviour have plummeted and mm. success in schools, keeping kids in school and not truanting, the success rates are extraordinary because it's community driven and because it's right there and we're listening to the people who are affected and letting them come up with solutions that help them. Yeah. It's essential. Thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, it's a tiny window, I know, but yeah. I think an essential um, sharing from, from someone who, who rides the, 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 often the divide between compassionate community response and law. I was watching something last night which had nothing to do apparently with law, but um, Simon Sinek was talking about how in the 70s, 80s, Milton Friedman basically said, you know, business is about maximum profit within the bounds of law. And he said, you know, so what we see then is that law is the lower standard of ethics. And I think when you build, when you have the capacity to, to shape law together with um, a, a listening heart, a compassion, a willingness to, to connect with the other, not, not just to see the other, but to connect and listen, then you move to a world of ethics. So law is serving something that is generative for our humanity. And I, I think, Pauline, I, I'm, I'm going to slip back to um, theatre now. I read a book in, I don't know, the 90s or something, and I can't remember the, the name of the director, but it was the, he was an English director, and he was the one who invented theatre sports, you know, the great joy of, I remember going so often to the Nimrod, it was the Nimrod back then, and then the Belvoir, to so many theatre sports where you've, you know, got the games of improvisation, yeah. which I think is life. And it, in, in a sense, what we do at the Optimus Heart here, like you and I didn't plan this at all, right? No. It's, it's about showing up and listening yeah. being with the other and seeing what happens and not blocking. And one of the things that he said in this was in, for improvisation to work, you need to listen in order to be changed. Mm. And I, for me, that's been a fundamental principle. And I, and I think whilst when you're saying about listening to First Nations people because they know what will work for them and then it's a collaborative effort moving forward, I think uh, we were talking with... Um, uh, Tyson Yankaporta and his work on Sand Talk. I think we can listen in order to understand what might serve our humanity better as well. It's not just what's going to serve them because, you know, there's a lot of disconnectedness from self, from land, from country that has people feeling incredibly unstable, anxious and uncertain and unhappy. Mm. So that's, you know, I know I just did a big rave then, but I, I'd love to just hear what you have got to add into that because this whole thing of it's, and you studied communication, you know, what this listening 
that brings about change and what doesn't allow us to change, to be prepared, willing to change? I, I think I think you bang on with listening, listening in order to be changed because otherwise all you're doing is hearing. Mm -hmm. You're not actually listening. Um, if, if you're not willing to be changed by what you're hearing, then you're not listening. Yeah. Um, so you can't be stuck to, to your own, you know, your own path. You need to be prepared to change tack when, when you're, when the information being given to you is not what you expect or not known to you until now, how can you not be changed by that? I've, I've been involved. I was a co-founder of a, a festival here on the central coast called the five lands walk. And it's, um, it's a, an incredible festival. It started with a couple of hundred people in 2006. And last year we had 22,000. Wow. So it's just, it's a beautiful um, festival. It celebrates the ancient part, past of this incredible land that we live on and the, the Aboriginal culture. But it also celebrates who we are today and what connects us to country, what connects us to, to place and to each other. So the, the mantra of the, the Five Lands Walk is connecting people to people and people to place. Mm. And it is about walking together. Um, and as you walk together, you listen to each other, you tell stories, you hear each other's stories. So you, you walk from, through each of the five villages. It's a coastal walk, it's a 10 kilometer walk. Mm -hmm. And each of the five villages hosts different celebrations. There are art exhibitions, sculptures, um, there's theatre, there's um, music, there's food, there's Aboriginal cultural um, talks, there's whale watching, there's, um, there's an extraordinary richness of, of multiculturalism along the way that you experience as you walk. But you walk with people and you hear things and you listen mm. and you listen to the land too. You, you, you're, sometimes you're on streets, but mostly you're in the bush or on sand. So you're hearing the sounds around you. You're listening to that too, and that changes you. And so does listening to the music, listening to the um, cultural talks about the significance of the whale to the Darkenjung people. Um, listening to talks about bush tucker um, all of these things if you take them in change you and i must say in my in my years listening to people getting that festival together every year um, and listening to the spiritual significance of country has changed me it, it, fundamentally i think and it's, it's woven its way into my work as a lawyer and a, a legal politician, if you like. Yeah. Well, in a sense, Pauline, it, if you really are listening, which is about absorbing, isn't it? Listening is not about hearing, as you say. Mm -hmm. It's about letting something in and do alchemy on you. Yeah. How make you, make you other. And so then, of course, of course, if you allow that to happen, who you show up as in your work, the way you, the way you understand things changes, the way you express things changes. So there has to be a, a kind of, uh, again, last night I heard Simon Sinek said, an existential flexibility. You, you have to be not uh, non-attached to a sense of identity. And I think what I've, what I've understood in my own experience and in, in, in reading in conversations, whether here or in other countries with First Nations peoples, is that you, if you're disconnected with, with country, if you're disconnected from place, you, it's hard to be connected, almost impossible to be connected to self as well. Or to other people. Or to other people. And, and I think that we've, you know, we've, we have stopped listening to, listening to country and listening to 
what it really tells us deeply. And I think that's, that's where a lot of our human problems come from, the, you know, the mental health issues that we were all suffering across Australia in, at higher and higher rates. There's something happening. And I think it comes from disconnection um, where we're more connected than ever um, through, through devices. And, and I think COVID-19 has shown us that we can actually use these devices quite productively and creatively like you are with this, um, with this kind of format. Um, we can use that to, to stay connected in, in a substantial way. Yeah. Um, it's not quite as good as face to actual face, but face to virtual face is not too bad. Um, but we've lost something in Western society that has lost that human connection. Um, and we, we need to start listening to each other and really allowing that alchemy to happen within ourselves. We're the same, but different. Yeah. Um, we're just absorbing new, new thoughts, new ideas, new ways of seeing the world. And um, that makes us richer. Yes. And it makes us closer. We start to understand each other and fear each other less. And uh, that's really important if we're going to have a peaceful world. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, we're, go we're going to, not just yet, Vic, but we're going to bring some questions in. I, there's a couple of questions here. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that we'll go to, to them exactly, but um, someone's also, Kerry is talking about, little bit adding on to what you're just saying now about mental health and you know the sort of um movement of of drugs and alcohol and dependencies and I, I was thinking about this when you were talking about planning you know and and sort of environmental work there was some a young guy who who lost a number of people in, who were close to him um to overdose we had a friend who we lost to an overdose all those years ago all the you know um anyway he he decided he needed to find out what what is it that has people kind of go into addictions to that level so he traveled the world checking out all sorts of different things trying to find an answer and he found one um a scientist psychiatrist maybe who set up um you know, a, a, a rat lab and had heroin and water, you know, set up in the, the cage. And 100% of the time, the rats died from an overdose, 100%. Yeah. And then at some point he went, hang on a sec, it's a really boring cage in there and all there is is heroin. Yeah. That's the only option to, for the rat to feel a little bit better. What if we make a rat fun park? We put some ratinas in there so, you know, it's a party and, you know, they can have a bit of a flirtation and, you know, and the heroin as well. And he said the interesting thing was that without fail, all of them tried the heroin, the sort of sucker of heroin, but they never went back. They never went back a second time and they never overdosed. Oh, wow. Because an environment, environmental sustaining, environmentally sustaining for the, for the spirit, you know, I was going to say the human or the rat spirit. But I think it speaks to what you're talking about, your festival and, and the connection and not fearing others when we start to listen and we, we share experiences. I think that's absolutely right. If we have if there are um, creative outlets for, for a living being to, uh, to fulfill their needs and desires and wants, um, that, that takes away the need for artificial stimulus and artificial experiences. When you've got real experiences, um, you don't need that. Sometimes people will have over stimulus and will turn to drugs to numb that a bit yeah. um, and one can understand that uh, there, there are people who for instance come back from war there are people who have been in horrific violent childhoods or mm. horrific violent 
marriages who will turn to substances to dull that those experiences to actually forget those experiences mm. so we need to create a society where you've got you've got the right kind of experiences that people can have to to not have to rely on drugs to get by um, yeah. and to support people so that they don't need to be violent because that's that's a really important thing um, we focus so much on the victims of violence which is essential of course it's essential I'm not saying it's not mm. but we also need to be looking at what it is that makes people violent um, and it is largely men but what is it that makes men violent why we need to address that as a society because it's it's shocking that you know, I think it's 45 women this year have been killed by intimate partners yeah. in Australia. And that's just shocking. It's absolutely shocking, yeah. And I don't know if they're with us this week, but we do have um, uh, Martin Gillespie and Gareth Andrews who are both doing work with men. Um, because, yes, it's, it's not a natural thing no. for anyone to... I, I, I remember having a conversation, to be violent, right? I remember having a conversation after I, I saw a, another episode of Q&A a couple of years ago, which also named a number of femicides impossible. To, I just thought, what is it? We're in Australia. I was back visiting. Ah, Martin's here. Terrific. We might get you to share something in a minute, Martin. Um, and I, I called the young there's a young counsellor who's up on the Gold Coast and I called him and went and met with him. And because I could, I, I, there's nothing in me that can believe that any human being, any man would wake up in the morning and want to think, oh, terrific, today I get to beat the crap out of or, oh. or kill someone I supposedly love. So what happens with that human being? What, what is it that we're not even seeing as oh. a society? that needs to be addressed. And so, yeah, I love that you I love that in your role, your many roles, mm -hmm. um, your life, your person beingness, you're looking at this kind of full landscape. That's just tremendous. Um, Pauline, uh, I want to have a look this Trish is, um, I'm going to come to you in a sec, Shrikant, because I think the this question about what a, what are the three biggest problems? I, I, I tend not to talk so much about problems, but Srikanth is asking, what are the three biggest problems that you think that we need to be addressing? And I, we could probably have a guess at some of them. And Trish is, Trish is um, harking back to when she was working in the 80s. In a, she was a PA in one of the major law firms. Now she's this exquisite celebrant and transitions of people leaving this life and moving on. So she does this now. Um, but she said it was a, it was up, utmost respect, but everybody knew their place and women really never had a chance to, um, go ahead. They, young female, female lawyers, um, were treated, they were seen as inferior and she said, yeah, has that changed? Look, it has, um, it's, it's not changing fast enough. Women have been, um, more than 50% of graduates out of universities for a very long time now um, it's up to sort of 65 percent or something but women in leadership in the legal profession is still um, is, is still well below uh, 50 percent um, you know barristers who are kind of the st high status part of our, our, our profession in a way um, it's still only around about 25 percent female um, the bench, the lower levels of the bench are doing very well in terms of gender equity in the magistrates' courts. Um, but as you get up into the Supreme Court, it's much less. Um, the High Court, interestingly, is getting very much more gender equal. Um, where it's imminent that we're going to have two new High Court judges uh, appointed shortly. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're seeing and, and senior partners in the large law firms are, 
again, there's not gender equity there. Um, at the lower level of all of these organisations, you see you see women uh, taking an equal share, but at the higher levels, you you don't, um, and that's still got to change. And women still earn less than men do in law, so that's um, that's got to change. Uh, so I, I think that yes, we're we're treated well um, in lots of ways, but there's still there is still a gender divide in the law. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's interesting. My niece, I think, is twenty five. She uh, finished her HSC with full marks in her HSC, and she had did I think law commerce at at Sydney with oh. full scholarship for her whole um, education. Was then wooed by you know seven of the the top firms, and she oh. she chose a second tier for its culture. She said, yeah, that's where I want to be. And then she fell in love with one of the partners, so she had to leave <laughs> the organisation. And during lockdown, she's decided she just doesn't want to do it. She, you know, after all of this, she's really that she's going to study to do coaching. Yeah. And, you know, I just said, I that's not a life. It's not a life. I so I think, you know, cultural fit sometimes you know, at those upper echelons, it's like, yeah. I get to choose and that's not what I choose. <laughs> well, that's very much right, Caroline. Um, when I was a very young, my first job um, after graduating was in fact at a large law firm. And I literally lasted 10 weeks. <laughs> I just went, no, this doesn't, this doesn't fit me. And, and I accepted a job that I was offered out at Campbelltown in a criminal law firm. Mm -hmm. And um, I was much happier there. So even though it was it was a fraction of pay, yeah. but I I knew it was that life was not going to be for me. I realised very soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's uh, there's some tricky questions here, Margot. Your your question I don't think is for for us to answer, but I'm going to put it in case Pauline's got something to say, and maybe we can hear from Martin. Um, which is why is it that my ex-partner thinks that it's still okay to beat up his current partner? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that, that is such a, a difficult question. You know, I had a client who, who was accused of, she was charged with murder because her de facto husband was beating her with an iron a domestic iron and she picked up a little vegetable knife that was on the sideboard next to her and stabbed him once and he died well after she was charged and she was in trial a woman who had been an ex-partner of his came forward and said he did this to me too so she gave evidence at my client's trial and my client was acquitted so Thank you to Margot for asking that question because that's precisely what this brave woman did. She came forward and said, I, she didn't want to see a woman convicted of murder um, when she knew how violent her ex-partner had been. And, um, and I'm very grateful to her for being so brave to come forward with that. It's, it's, um, it's important that women do speak up. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks, Pauline. Um, I, I want to come to Martin and ask you if you have a response. Maybe you don't. I I think that often what happens, I, I heard a talk once by someone who said, you know, that when there's, when there's violence, domestic violence, what we have is a situation, this was a guy giving a, a talk, where... You know, there's a, um, a a violent act or a series of violent acts, and then then there's the abused woman, then there's the abused woman in recovery, and then it's her story, and the guy disappears from the story. There's no more language that that says this person needs some support to not behave like that. Yeah. And um, Martin, maybe you can't tell us the whole. 
um, kind of the wholeness of this, but it would be great to um, it would be great to hear you're doing some work. You've just started bringing men together who are sharing in this sort of deep listening space and heartful space, compassionate space, the wholeness of one person. And can you share with us a little bit, we're going to have to close in a, in a little bit um, because we've passed our hour, but it's just too rich to just close off yet. So Martin, have, can you respond, maybe not directly into the answer, but share something from your experience? Because I think it's rich. We need you off mic though. I mean on mic, off mute. Uh, why can't we can't hear you? Uh, you should be able to hear me now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hi, Pauline. How are you? Um. So I run one of the projects I run is a men's circle here in the community of Warunga, um, in Sydney. And over the last four or five weeks, I bring a theme to the discussion, and I've had twenty six glorious men come and talk about emotions, and finding a safe place to talk. And Caroline, your, your, your point is fantastic at the moment. The topic last week was the topic of intimacy. And from intimacy came the topic of rape. Now, I have two teenage daughters, and all the, the men in front of me all had sons. And to discuss the emotional aspect of what you would immediately do if your son or daughter was either accused of or a victim of rape was incredibly powerful to hear men discuss it in safety. I was going to say before an act of rape happened, but to be able to discuss that, 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 that's one of the many glorious conversations that we're having. And I would say that men are losing their voice in society just now because we're too scared. We've, we've lost that, we're, we're kind of lonely about our emotional self. And um, I'm only facilitating this conversation, but it's, it's enriching that men are now coming forward in a community environment. And you spoke very beautifully, Pauline, around, you know, when you mentioned the Uluru statement of the heart, how beautiful, we forget that it takes a village to raise children. What happens through life that we, we lose ourselves a little bit and we think we don't need that community again? We need that community more so now than we've ever needed before. Couldn't agree with you more, Martin. I think it's, I think it's vital. And men, you know, there are a lot of men who do feel disempowered because the world is changing and, and they've, there is a loss of that means of communicating their feelings. And as you've said, it's, it's vital that everybody should feel safe to express their emotions. Um, and we've got to find a way to do that because emotions will out. And if they don't come out in a safe way, in the sorts of forums that you're talking about or just in their day-to-day -day relationships, they, they come out as, as violent expressions of emotion. And um, Pauline, one of my dear friends is actually a senior barrister in Sydney and his chambers was a few doors down from Katrina Dawson, the, the lady who lost her life tragically in the Lint Cafe. And his aspect was, I worked next to this woman but I didn't know who she was because I wasn't connected with her. I was too focused on trying to do my job all the time. Yeah. And we need to make time for our next door neighbor, our colleague, more so than we've ever done before. Martin, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's just great having you part of this community each week and sharing the richness of, of what's, what's emerging that you knew would, you were kind of listening to your own heart and took the, the steps and one day we'll hear more of your story too. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, Alex, I'm, I'm the, we're going to hold your question, bring it over and Stephen's put a question and Shrikant put his. Let's finish with the official formal way because we've gone over, but um, Shrikant asked, what are the three main 
problems or issues that, that you would say in order to get to this, I, I wouldn't say utopia, I would, but last week we talked and the week before guests saying, you know, I believe we can co-create heaven on earth. This is possible. And you're talking about something very similar. So what would be your three main issues that you would put focus on um, if we were to genuinely move ourselves closer to that? Such a huge question. Um, sure. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think we, we, we have to, in an ideal world, we would all listen to one another with that readiness to change. We would all, we're faced with a choice. Be kind, take the kinder route. Um, so if we were listening to each other and we were kinder to one another, the, they would be two really important things. Um, the third one I think is be kind to yourself as well. And I think that's come out of one of the questions that I was just reading. I think that you do have to look after yourself because if you can't, if you're not look up, looking after yourself, how can you look after the ones you love? If you're not well yourself, if you're not mentally well, if you're not physically well, you can't look after those around you and you can't function properly as a human being. So I think, you know, that, those three things, if we did, if we all did those, we'd we'd be heading in the right direction. I think. Fantastic, thank you. And and when you talk about looking after yourself, and Tammy said this last week, if I'm not well, I can't be well for the people I love. It's yeah. just not possible. And there's a there's an interesting study of ten thousand service people from the U.S. military. It's going back a few years now, but. You know this this um, survey that's often done that looks at um, the impact of change and stress on well-being and and health and well-being, and they looked at you know seventy nine percent of people were were either under the pressure of change had accidents, um, illnesses, etc. But then they took a look at the twenty one percent. And it became the 21% study, the 21% who were fine, no matter what changes took place, no matter what stresses externally. And they, they were people very much like you. So they had hobbies, they had a sort of, um, it, whether or not a religious, but a spiritual, something that sustained them, a set of values or a way of understanding the world. They did some kind of exercise they had community, um, they, they enjoyed the work that they did. And these people were able to withstand change and stress and stay well. And I think you're exemplifying that in, in the way you live your life. Um, so you can speak very authentically to what these three things, these three issues might be. Um, so Pauline, why do we have to finish? I don't want to finish, Victor. <laughs> really, we, um, it's just great having you here. I'm so, so pleased, deeply pleased to have um, found you again and to be inspired. Oh, my Caroline, I'm so grateful. It's, it's, been, it's been a really amazing conversation. I, congratulations to, to you on this, this forum. It's, it's fantastic yeah it's just just gorgeous gorgeous yeah. thank you we have a lovely group of people who are, victor will start bringing up in a sec um and then we, we hang around for about 10 minutes more or however long you can stay it'd be great to have you here well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the optimist heart um it was uh, from our perspective absolutely fantastic and enjoyable um, if you haven't joined the center for optimism please go to our website, centerforoptimism.com. Uh, you can sign up for a free subscription. You can sign up to become a member. But we'd love you to have involved, be involved in our optimism movement, um, our optimism centre, and to stay in touch, most importantly, with Caroline Ward's The Optimist Heart.